got into some like harder drugs with methamphetamine and she ended up getting pregnant while I was in high school. We had to go back home that night knowing that she was carrying two dead babies. The first time I did LSD, I felt like something was taken from me. I think drugs open up a spiritual realm yeah. that you don't have control over. Hi, and welcome to Real Talk. I am your host, Ron Strand. We are glad that you're joining us today. And today we are on the third part of our, uh, I guess you'd say a three-part series. We started with two individuals by the name of Josh Hansen and Barrett Johnson, who were the group Man of Leisure musical group. And if you haven't watched that uh, segment yet, go back and watch it. It's, the, it's my interview with Man of Leisure. Give you a little bit about their background and their music. We also interviewed Barrett individually about his life. Watch that one too. But today we're going to focus on Josh Hansen, who is one half of Man of Leisure. Josh, welcome to Real Talk, or welcome back, I should say. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah. Well, you know, the folks got uh, a taste of your music, and of course, you know, I'll tell a little bit about Josh. Josh is the winner of the 2013 International Songwriting Competition. Uh, he's also the front man for a group called Yellow Red Sparks. He's also been in a group called JD's Lantern with his brother, Johnny. And then, of course, your, your work with Man of Leisure. And uh, if you haven't listened to Josh's music, go back and listen to it. It's incredible stuff. But today we're going to focus a little bit about you, your testimony, mm -hmm. your, your, uh, your story about a man as a man of faith, uh, and the, and some of the things that you've had to endure as a young man and into your more adulthood and uh, so I, because I think there's a fascinating story there so let's let's dig into that okay uh, Josh you you grew up here in uh, Southern California Irvine um, and tell us a little bit about your your early upbringing um, yeah grew up in Southern California um, good home. Uh, good good area and yeah just kind of typical childhood um trying to figure things out and uh going through the ups and downs of all that and uh yeah <laughs> i mean <laughs> pretty typical all-american upbringing yeah right? Irvine, yeah california and, yeah i mean yeah. my parents were a little different than most of my friends really so, yeah my mom was uh, out every night singing at lounge, like lounge type bars. Let's clarify clubs. that though. It doesn't look like your mom was out hanging out at lounges. She was she, a professional she, she's singer. She's a professional singer, right. a beautiful singer, yes, amazing voice. Uh, yes. My dad uh, was in like an 80s band, like sort of new wave stuff. And yeah. they, they would practice in our living room. Uh, just music was a big part of the family. So yeah. that was, uh, that was really cool to have because a lot of my friends didn't have that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that was a big focus. And then also just, uh, faith and, and, uh, know, knowing God on a, on a deeper level. So faith was in the household. Yeah. And so you, you remember that from an early age. Mm -hmm. Did you, did, did it, um, did you adopt that faith early on did you rebel did, how did you yeah uh, my mom said that when i was about three i was in my crib saying like praise the lord <laughs> uh so i think early on there was something for sure um I, I did i did suffer from like some really intense dreams like night terrors when i was younger um that would freak my dad out because uh, I would literally be walking with my eyes open, seeing things, and <laughs> he, wow. would, he would be like, "Where, where?" Yeah. Um, but yeah, as I as I got older, I, I definitely re rebelled quite a bit, and um, I think I just became angry with with God in a lot of ways um, because I felt like He created us, but we can't communicate in the way that He created us. I couldn't talk to him. I couldn't just hear him. I couldn't call him on the phone. Uh, so that was really difficult for me to to understand. So when you say you you rebelled, what does that 
What does that look like? Um, you know, I, I started listening to music that my parents, you know, weren't very fond of and uh, started getting into drugs and just lying and um, just just felt really, really lost, you know. So the, the feeling of not being able to communicate with God in the way, as you say, the way he created us. But so prayer wasn't something that you felt you were connecting with, it sounds like. I, I, did, I did pray quite a bit. Um, I would ask my dad some challenging questions as a younger kid that um, I don't know if he had the answer for. And he would, you know, say, why, why don't you ask the Lord? And then that's what I would do. Um, and I would, you know, go in my room by myself and, and, and have that, those talks, uh, but not being able to get a response, I guess, in the way that I thought I should yeah. was, was really frustrating. So you kind of thought there was going to be an immediate response and God was going to speak to me and give me this direction yeah. and it didn't, didn't plan it to yeah. plan out that way. And yeah. so, so you started rebelling and just, and, and, and did you kind of just walk away from the faith or? Yeah, I would. I wouldn't say I, I ever stopped believing there was a God. I thought that was silly, um, but I think I started um, just really doubting mm -hmm. uh, what what it all was. Yeah, and uh, especially the the church and how that functioned and 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 what that was and um, the the motives behind different people within the church and. Um, yeah, and seeing some of the, the 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 scenes behind the curtain at church, like doing worship and stuff like that, um, just just gave me a weird taste for it. Yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, there's there's that you know. Yeah. Wherever we put our hand, man puts his hand. You know, it's yeah, kind of screws things up sometimes. So you see some of those things that just kind of turn you off, and you kind of go your own way. So you're in high school, you're you're experimenting with drugs. Mm -hmm. um, you you end up getting married very young yeah so the my girlfriend at the time um i felt uh that i needed to get out of the relationship and i was trying to if you know it was our first my first relationship trying to figure out how to get out of it because it was such like an emotional attachment with the sexual aspect of it and uh and she ended up getting pregnant while i was in high school and, uh, you know, she was probably, I don't know, four, four to five months along. Uh, and I decided that, well, I had gotten saved within that, okay, that interim. So, yeah. yeah. So, so basically, um, I, I got into some like harder drugs with methamphetamine and, uh, we, someone but what happened? Okay, so I went to a Harvest Crusade of all places, um, and I was sitting there and I was listening, and I knew like I wanted some something to change. Uh, and both of my friends at the time were both meth users with me, and um, well, I I had kind of gone. Uh, sorry, I kind of I could quit meth at that point. I was just looking for a change. Anyway, when he did the altar call, I said. I waited for a moment and my friends were just kind of laughing. And I said, I don't know about you guys, but I'm going down on the field. So I, I just went down on the field and um, they ended up following me down there. And uh, that's when things started to change. And I started getting really interested in prophecy and, uh, you know, the end times and stuff like that, which, you know, is everyone's got their own opinion on it. But uh and and just more of the i guess the mystical part of the bible i didn't realize how much in there especially in revelation that it's just like kind of mind blowing yeah, right but so i ended up marrying uh my ex my ex wife uh now ex wife now ex wife yeah uh right out of high school yeah yeah so let's go back to that harvest crusade you're sitting there are you, and you obviously something took you there i mean did your parents take you there or did you just go on your own or what i honestly don't remember how we got there yeah um but something something captured your captured your heart to want to go down it was what do you remember anything particular i, I just i just felt like um i couldn't there was something I, there was something missing and i knew it was god i don't know how i knew that but i knew it was god um, and it just, it, it almost pulled me out of my seat because at that time, you know, friends are kind of everything. And I, I honestly didn't care if they, what they thought of me or yeah. if they were coming or not. Sure. So 
it was just something I felt like I had to do. Um, so you, you, you make this commitment of faith you've got, and, and was your girlfriend pregnant at this time or was this, did this come later? Did, that was like right before she got right pregnant. before. Yeah. So then you, 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 your faith is renewed. You go forward at a crusade. Um, and now you find out that the girl that you've been dating, who you've actually trying to break up with, right. is now pregnant. Yeah, and I was trying to break up with her because I had found out that she was cheating on me for like three months. Oh, my. Okay. Um, which was really heartbreaking for me as a kid because sure. I, I just didn't think that happened. I didn't think, I don't know. I didn't think someone would sleep with someone else at, yeah. that, at that age. Sure. I thought that was more of like an adult thing. But, um, yeah. So you end up marrying her. Mm-hmm. And then the children are born, and that was that didn't end well. Or I mean, to talk about that. Yeah. So she was pregnant with twins, and uh, you know we we ended up getting excited about it. I was prepared to be a dad. And, um, and how old are you at this point, Josh? I had just turned eighteen, wow. and we uh, we were living on our own. Did you feel? Excuse me for yeah. interrupting. Did you feel pressured to get married because she's pregnant and it was the right thing to do? I, d- I did feel like it was the right thing to do, but I definitely didn't feel pressure like everyone was telling me not to. Yeah. I, d- I felt just in my heart uh, that, you stepped up that, and... that that was something that I needed to do. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Which is interesting because if I didn't do that and we did lose the twins, we ended up losing the twins to stillborn almost a full term. I I wouldn't have had I wouldn't have the kids I have now, which yeah. I'm so grateful for. Right. But um, basically, we were uh, she was in the she she wasn't feeling the baby's move, and uh, she called me from work, and I came home, and then we went to the do- the hospital or the doctor, and they did an ultrasound, and I just remember there were two doctors, and one was saying, "Do do you see?" and said, "Yep," and then, "Do you see?" said yep and right away i was just you like knew. i knew and i went into the bathroom of that room and i was just crying out to god please like save these kids like please don't let this be happening please 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 and um yeah that that's when they told us that they had both they, they both were gone so it's it, it kind of sucked because we had to go back home that night knowing that she was carrying two dead babies and i just remember just uh holding each other and, mm. and crying uh, and then she had to give birth to the babies. They had yeah. to induce labor and give birth to the babies. And then we held the babies for, um, I don't know, maybe an hour or so. And then we had to, to bury them and have like a funeral and stuff oh, for the gosh. twins. Yeah, I, I can't imagine going through that at 18 years old. I mean, at 18 years old, I couldn't even relate to anything like that. And here you are, yeah. you step up, you get married. You, you find out that these twins that she's carrying that are your children are are, are dead in the womb, right? Stillborn, mm-hmm. and now you're picking up the pieces. Uh, yeah, and now you've got this marriage that you felt compelled to marry, and you, now you're married. And, and how did things go from that point on after that? Um, she was like a, a wreck. I mean, I I was, I I was obviously upset, but after I accepted the fact that 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 is what it, you know, yeah, was it. Um, I, I remember just telling her that this is the time that we either trust God or we blame him. And she 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 took she took the route of blaming God for that. And I, I took the route of trusting that that was part of his plan. Um, and the other thing was she after that happened, she just had this intense desire to have a baby like right away. And I was just like, I'm so young, like this is like I don't you know anyway we we ended up having our first child uh like pretty soon after that so and that child's now how old Kayla she's 26 she's 26 years old yeah wow and you you ended up having three more yeah with this wife mm-hmm. and uh, you know I know your kids they're all yeah. great kids you just you've done a great job as a dad so Thanks. uh you guys are going along and you're you're in your musical career mm-hmm. um trying to make your way in music and raising as a young man, I mean, eventually four children. Mm-hmm. Um, how did, did that put a lot of strain on your relationship? And Yeah. I mean, she, she didn't understand the music thing. She, she was really against it. Um, 
she said things like you love more you love music more than your family she told the kids you know he loves music more than you guys obviously mm. and um yeah it was really hard because music to me was something really that was really important to me it was a way to express how i was feeling and and all sorts of things and to connect on this different level um but yeah she she wasn't supportive of it um at all but but I don't know. I just, I kept doing it um, and just kind of had one foot in, one foot out the whole time. Um, and then later on, I, I sort of was just like, I'm just going to kind of put more effort into this as things progressed with Yellow Red Sparks. But um, yeah, she wasn't, she wasn't into it. Yeah. And you did some other work, you know, outside of music, I know, to, to augment your income. And yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And so how's your faith during this time? I mean, you, you, you went forward at the concert and, and or at the crusade and made a commitment and, and then now you're struggling with a wife that's kind of moving in this direction. You're moving in this direction. She's not supporting what you're doing and you've got kids at home, which is a stress in and of, in and of itself. And now yeah. you're, you're both young people. That's kind of a pressure cooker there. Yeah. It was tough. I mean, it, we we both, I think, tried to make it work. And I think in the beginning it was it was cool. I mean, we had Bible studies and at our at our house, and it was just really cool, organic type things. And we would turn off all the lights and have worship and stuff. and it was really cool. Um, but as it as it progressed in our marriage, she would say things like, you know, I never see you read your Bible. Like, do you even like, are you even a Christian? Like just cer certain things that just turned me off. It was very like, um, I, I don't know how to explain it, but it just made me feel like you don't know my relationship with God at all. But yeah. um, it, it just got to the point where like my plan was to move to, to divorce after all the kids were 18. Um, but it just got to the point where it was just too much, um, it was just too much. I was just so depressed and I would like sit, lay on the couch while they went and did stuff. And, uh, there was just a lot of just mistrust and on both sides. And, um, yeah, I finally just decided this is, you know, what I have to when do. When did you know? I mean, at what point and how long were you married at that point? Oh gosh. Uh, probably like 13 years, maybe. Wow. Yeah. It was, it was a bit, um, and I was so upset when she got pregnant with our fourth, who, gosh, I love so much. But sure. um, I was just, it was just another, like, she, she it felt like she just wanted to keep me, like, no matter what. And um, sorry, where were we going? The question? The, when you kind of knew that oh, it was. Oh, yeah, when I knew it was over. Well, it was funny because she was going to this counselor that she was seeing who apparently was like a prophetess and stuff. And, uh, you know, I was like, well, why don't you come to my counselor? She's like, no, you have to come to my counselor. I'm like, well, why don't we just get a counselor and try to do marriage counseling thing? Anyway, I go to her counselor um, and I just start talking to her and stuff. And and her name is Marty. And she's like, you know, a lot of the things that, that you've been telling me about him don't line up they don't add up and you know he actually communicates really well and this and that and it just the, it was like not going her way and she was pissed like super pissed and she was just we're not doing that again like da 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 so i was just like over it i was like okay well you know this is just a weird game and i don't want to play it i was just sick of it like i didn't know and and and, and in retrospect it's interesting because she ended up marrying a woman um, I'm convinced by people that I've spoken to in, in like the field of psychology that she has borderline or psychiatry, psychology, that she has borderline personality disorder, which is a very complex, uh, mental illness. Sure. And, um, and I ended up also getting sole custody of all four kids, which, which is unheard of, especially here for, for a dad to get. So, um, you know, and, and none of the kids see her at all anymore. So I think it was the right decision. Um, I, I, I always root for marriages to work. Um, I think divorce is just insanely difficult. And 
um, I was heard. I heard it said it was interesting how you know if you take two planks of wood and you glue them together and put a vice on them and let them sit overnight and then you try to split them, it just kind of tears both pieces apart, and that's yeah. that's what it's like. Um, and it was just a horrific time. The custody stuff. The kids felt like pawns. It was just something you know I, I wouldn't wish anyone to go through. Yeah. Oh, you're an incredible young man. So you you ended up raising four kids and. Uh, part of the time with you and your, your ex-wife, and then a good part of the time with the kids are, uh, that, that you have custody and you've raised them. But you've, you've and then you continued your musical career throughout, and, um, and you end up finding love again. Yeah. Yeah. Thank Tell God, yeah. That. Well, I met my wife through the music uh, industry. She was working for a major label at the time, and um, our label was on a subsidiary of them. And uh, just it was just it was just interesting because the first time I met her family, I was like, "Gosh, like I love her mom. She's just so sweet and and amazing." And I could say that about my my previous mother in law. And she she was just so supportive, uh, and so she she never once made me feel like you know you need to spend more time with me. Like she she put the kids first. Which is really a, a miracle in my eyes. Like it was never like, I never felt like I was. There was like this competition at all, yeah. and um, she became a, a mom to them, and that's who what they call her, and that's what they looked at to her as. It just all of it was a miracle in my opinion, and yeah. I, I told her from the beginning. I was like, not from the beginning, but as things progressed, I was like, hey, like this isn't easy. Yeah, and you know you can. I totally get it if you don't want to do this, you know, like go further um, because it, it's gnarly and, uh, but it's also wonderful, you know, yeah. but yeah, she, she, she got a lot of baggage, you know, she, she I came with a lot of baggage and um, she's just my best friend and I trust her. That's the biggest thing. Like I trust her so hard, like so hard. Um, I just trust her and that, that's so important. Yeah. Well, she's a remarkable woman for her to come in because most, a lot of people would just be scared. You know, yeah, I wouldn't do it. She's got four kids yeah. from a previous marriage. But she comes in, not only does she come in and not accept them, but she becomes a mother figure to them. And they, oh, yeah. they look at her and call her mom. Yeah. And that's, that's quite amazing. I, Michelle's a remarkable woman. Mm. You're a blessed man. But, you know, it hasn't always been peaches and cream for you. You've... You've uh, worked very hard in the industry, and uh, and uh, but you started. Let's let's get into the into the details about some things that have happened to you over the last five years, I guess we'd say, mm -hmm. uh, because you started getting some. I mean, you have you struggled with depression um, throughout your life, or is that? Yeah, I mean, I think that the drugs caused a lot of imbalances in my mental uh, state. Um, I, I struggled with, with depression, um, since I can remember really, and just kind of, uh, I think the anxiety came later, but the depression was, was something that started. Um, and they actually put me on, uh, Prozac when I was, I think I was 17 to help mitigate some of the effects of not being on like a methamphetamine anymore. Um, so when you say drugs contributed to it, when you say, are you saying abuse, abuse of drugs or drugs that you took for those kind of things? No, I think abuse of drugs. I, I yeah. think, yeah, like the first time I did LSD, I felt like something was taken from me um, that I wow. couldn't get back. I think that drugs in general are, they open up a spiritual realm yeah. that you kind of don't have control over. And don't understand. So um, I think that that affected uh, me greatly, for sure. So you felt like it robbed you of something. It, oh, the yeah. The LSD trip took something away from you. Actually, oh, yeah, definitely. Took something away from mm -hmm. you. So you continue to, to struggle bouts of of uh, depression and anxiety. And uh, were you, and you were, did you take medication into adulthood with this? Yeah, I went off and on. I always wanted to get off of it. Um, 
but then it would it would just kind of come back. Uh, the anxiety came later, where it was just full blown panic attacks. Uh, the first time it happened, I was taken in an ambulance, and then when I got to the hospital, I just had no idea what had happened to me. Um, and they they it, it sounded very dismissive because they're like, "Oh, you had a panic attack." I'm like, "Okay, well, I've heard of those before. This felt like I was dying." Um, but that that's what a panic attack feels like. And so. it's probably an, a, a bad name for it though, right? Because if you're <laughs> yeah. going through it, uh, yeah. I mean, describe what you were feeling when you were going through um, it. Basically, I mean, I blacked out and fell on the floor um, and hit my head and then was taken. But basically everything just starts kind of closing in around you. I started feeling like every nerve in my body and just everything starts going black like you lose your eyesight and it feels like you're dying because you don't know what's happening it just feels like you're powering off the computer um and i've learned you know methods to help kind of without medication help kind of alleviate some of those things and stop the panic attack from like going full-blown but it took a while to kind of understand it a little more um but yeah and, you know, it could be a spiritual thing. It could be an attack on, I don't know, you know, who knows. Did, was there spirit? Was there a spiritual element to these, uh, to this breakdown or what would you call it? A breakdown or mental breakdown, me- emotional the breakdown? The mental breakdown came later and I definitely believe that it had a spiritual component to it. Um, that was next level. Um, that affected everyone in my life. So how, between the time that you had these, what they called a panic attack and you were, mm-hmm. went to the hospital because you fell down and broke, fell down and hurt yourself. Um, and then the, what you call a mental breakdown, what, how many, what period of time were you talking about in here? Um, I mean, I had anxiety for quite a while. The mental breakdown happened a few years ago, maybe four years ago. I'm not sure on the exact time. My wife would know cause she's good at that stuff, but <laughs> maybe five years ago yeah yeah um that was a culmination of things i think i was burning the candle at both ends uh my psychiatrist had recommended a smoking pot to alleviate some of the anxiety because i really didn't want to be on xanax or klonopin and stuff like that i wanted something natural um so i got into that but The THC level in marijuana today is so much greater than it was. I mean, even in the '60s, it's it's in it's a it's so such a psychoactive drug. Um, And if you already have like a predisposition for anxiety or for any sort of mental illness, um, it can definitely trigger it. So I think it was that. um, And lack of sleep. I stopped sleeping, and I was convinced too that. Uh, you know, God created sleep, so I don't need sleep. So, yeah. Yeah. So the doctor prescribes medical marijuana, basically, is what is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's smoking a joint. I mean, she she was a real legit psychiatrist, and then I went to like a quack doctor who basically gives you a slip and says, yeah, you can get medical marijuana. And so you're smoking the marijuana and you're you're taking your other drugs, your other meds, I guess Mm -hmm. you'd say. Um, But do you feel like that, are, are you saying that the marijuana smoking uh, was not a good thing for you? Oh, hundred percent. I think that I think that marijuana is a demonic uh, thing, and a lot of people have different feelings about this. And the first time you, you know, say that that marijuana is addictive, you'll get all of the weed heads coming out oh, sure. and, and arguing how much it's not addictive. And it's like, okay, why do you care? You know, it is addictive. But yeah. um, I think that you do open doors that shouldn't be open. And um, I think that it it takes away some of the, the guards that God has set for us. And I think that you become vulnerable to a spirit world that you don't understand. It changes your perception. Um, it, 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 it's just, uh, it's, it's, I think it's a lot darker than people understand. And the biggest lie in the marijuana industry is the marketing term where it's just it's just weed, right? Yeah. It's just weed. It's just weed. Like, oh, it's just weed. Well, yeah, it's just weed. <laughs> and and uh, yeah, I think especially with kids where they're you know their brains fully aren't developed that are smoking it and stuff. Yeah. I think it's just oh, yeah. terrible. Yeah, absolutely. 
So a little bit earlier, you said that the, the breakdown, the mental breakdown, you felt definitely had a spiritual element to it. Yeah, later on I did. Well, I guess in both, in, in the whole process, I felt something spiritual about it. Um, well, back up, if you would, a little mm-hmm. bit, because I do want to explore that. But back up a little bit. So this mental breakdown, talk about that. Do you feel comfortable talking about it? Yeah. And what What transpired and what, because I think it's important for folks maybe who have who have young teenagers or grandparents who have uh, grandchildren that might be going through these kind of things because they're very real. Yeah. Uh, what What was going on in your mind, and then what started happening? Because obviously, it it doesn't just come on and you're, you know, you go off the rails. It's it's a gradual thing, I'm assuming. Yeah, my wife started noticing changes. Um, other people would notice some changes in me. Um, and, and this is like the, this is the, the beginning of it, where um, I w- was working a lot. I mean, like a ton, not sleeping, um, feeling like I had a lot of insight to things and was figuring out the world and there were so many changes happening in our world at the time and trying to understand all of that and just diving into so many different things and trying to grasp it and it almost felt like a brain overload um and my wife and i were just having problem after problem for a few months and she said we're going to go to your mom's and we're gonna have like a family meeting and stuff and we had a family meeting <laughs> I actually packed stuff with me because I felt like I was going somewhere and I don't know why I, I thought that because she hadn't said anything. And She felt uh, like maybe this was an intervention kind of thing coming Yeah, on maybe they're going to just take me somewhere. So, uh, yeah, we're doing the family meeting. It doesn't go very well. I kind of took over the whole show and then I went into the side yard and this is the part I don't remember, but I do remember seeing a bunch of flashlights in my face and I thought it was like like beings from another planet or something. And then uh, that's all I remember. But basically I was kicking and screaming and there were cops and an ambulance guy. And uh, they said it was like I if, if if it wasn't like a mental breakdown, they would have arrested me for like how I was being. Really? And then they put me on like a stretcher and put me in the ambulance and I was strapped down. And they kept giving me things to like knock me out. It wouldn't knock me out. Like nothing would would do it. And then they put like a bag over my head, put me in the hospital. I was on in like the psych ward on their floor and they tied me to the bed and I had to like fall asleep. Eventually I fell asleep, but it was the most uncomfortable position. I'm, I'm like the toss and turner. Like I, I cannot get comfortable. It drives my wife crazy. But I could, I was just in this like position and, uh, Eventually fell asleep, and then they t- took me to a, a site. I was admitted into a mental hospital, and I was there for seven days, so like full week there. Um, During that whole stay there, are you still out, out of your state of mind? Are you still? I was. Um, I was kind of confused as to why I was there. I, I actually signed the paper to like go there, but I didn't realize what it was. I, I didn't realize how how crazy it was i mean you you had people that were i didn't think i was crazy i I was like when i went there i saw people that were deep into um like psychosis and all sorts of things and um i remember that they stripped me of my clothes and there's just all this crazy stuff that happened And, and when my wife came and visited me that same day i was in the corner of a room just like shaking um and they wouldn't give me my glasses either so it was hard to see um and there it was just a very chaotic place i mean it was it was it was crazy Uh, and and scary i I was really scared and i was also in a room with two other people and this one guy kept kind of saying stuff where he was like you might not make it through the night just all sorts of like strange things were happening and i just didn't feel safe there yeah you're already feeling out of your mind and then you yeah. get thrown in with some guys that just make it even worse. Yeah. It's a spiral effect. Yeah. So you're there for five days, you said? Five, uh, seven days. Seven yeah. Days. And, and then you finally get to a point where you're able to get out of there. You, did yeah, you feel I had like to you're do, back in your state of mind at this point? I had to do a hearing to get out, some sort of thing to get out and I got, got out. 
Um, I don't know. I felt like I was in a good state of mind or better, but to my family, I was still, something was off. So, um, that went on for a little longer. And then that's when the spiral down happened. That was so much greater than whatever that was. And it was even so worse than that breakdown experience. It was so, yeah, it was so dark that, um, you, you could just feel the darkness and, I became nonverbal and uh, I had to have my mom or someone like basically have me on watch. I was in bed all day for a month or two and I couldn't sleep at night at all. Nothing would help me sleep. Um, like Klonopin, like anything they gave me, nothing would help me sleep. And it was, it was interesting because the juxtaposition is and and they can label it bipolar or whatever like i have different thoughts on that but the, the one and you're in this state where you can't sleep but you're creating things and all this stuff and then on the other end you can't sleep but you feel like you're being tortured so it was just um yeah it was just a, an awful thing i wouldn't wish it on anyone did they diagnose you is you mentioned bipolar did they diagnose us they diagnose did you? Diagno diagnose me as bipolar um the but i don't i don't i just don't like those labels i think that um I, I just don't accept the the label of it um i haven't had anything happen since then i do think it was spiritual and you know i don't like the idea of something trying to take your identity and to me, like that has nothing to do with my identity. Yeah. Like I'm a child of God created in the image of God and that's it, period. And then everything else I can build on. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, and and there's, I'm not knocking people that do accept that. It's just for me personally, I think it was way more complicated than that. So your climb out of this hole, talk about that. I mean, is it did it just kind of ease up or was it just no i mean it took a while and just a therapy? lot of a lot of prayer a lot, a lot of, of prayer. prayer yeah yeah i know the therapy was kind of a waste of time because i was nonverbal. um and they took me to this place that they like put this thing on my head and it was scanning my brain waves and then it started playing this music of what my my brain hears and how it's functioning and it was this very dissonant like scary music it was so frightening <laughs> Um, but anyway, so slowly started climbing out, um, and my daughter, Emma had painted and, and wrote this beautiful like thing for me and it had scripture on it and all this stuff. And I would look at that every day and just praying and begging God to take me out of this darkness. It was so, it was, he was gone. Like God's God was just, was, it wasn't there. And every single thing that I could think of ever, any motive since I was a child was just being thrown at me nonstop. And I just didn't want to be, be here anymore. Um, and it was towards the end of it that the verse, he who endures till the end shall be saved, just hit me in a way that um, I had just never hit me before. And I just thought I have to endure. Like I have this, I have to endure this. Um, and when you're in that state, you forget about your family, you forget about everything. You just want the pain to stop. You just want to be done. And, um, I I'm just so grateful that that's not what happened. And I did feel like something was trying to get me to die. Like I literally felt like something was trying to convince me that this is it. It's over. You're done. Um, did you ever feel like Oh yeah. Oh yeah. hundred percent. Like it was in my mind, it was going to happen. Um, and you know, I even remember my dad, the, he, I said, will you pray for me? I feel like there's something on me. Like, I, I feel like there's something on me that wants like to take me like, and I don't think he understood what I was talking about at the time, but like, it was, it was heavy, you know, it was, it was a real heavy thing. I was hearing noises uh, at night when I couldn't sleep on the roof and my wife heard them too. So it wasn't like a schizophrenia thing. It was, it was, I feel like there was a weird, it was the weirdest time. Like, I, I don't know, you'd have to be there, but, um, yeah, I have so much empathy for people that struggle with those things because it's so dark. Um, and it's all in your head. But that's like, that's what you live in. Did you ever 
you know, I, I, in my previous interview with your musical partner, Barrett, I asked him because he had he struggled with certain things in his life. Did you ever feel in that place in your faith to say, curse God or just say, God, I'm angry? Or did, did you, what were you feeling in terms of your faith in, through all of this? I thought that God had abandoned me. Um, I thought that it was just over. Like, I, I thought, you know, but, but I still had a, a hope, you know, I had a hope that somehow that he could turn it around. And he did. He started turning things around. I mean, um, it definitely was a miracle. Uh, I mean, my wife was at the point where she wanted to just leave. Like, you know, I mean, I, I, I 100% would not be able to handle the stuff that she's handled from, you know, just everything, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and that made us grow stronger as a couple. And Barrett said this before where, like, you don't know. I, I'm going to totally butcher this, but basically you, you don't know how much someone loves you until you suffer together. And like, you don't really, you don't really understand love until you suffer together because love isn't the squishy, squashy, whatever little thing. It's so, so it's so deep and, and it's so much commitment and, uh, and sacrifice and just love for that other person. And she showed me that love. And I mean, that's, that's the love of Christ. Like Christ died for, uh for for the world so yeah i mean she's 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 an angel in my book absolutely and my family too well, i was just amazing. gonna say you yeah. you have an incredible support system around you with, yeah. between your kids your parents your wife um and uh and then so after you get through this you're uh and I, because i knew i do know your family very intimately and uh very close friends with them but your mother gets sick Mm-hmm. And uh, and this is not long after on the heels of no, not your long. your mental breakdown. Mm-mm. And not only does she just get sick, but she gets terminally sick. Mm-hmm. And you're very close to your mother. Oh yeah. So talk about what that what that did to your psyche at the time and how that all played out. Yeah, um, I, I just remember thinking, wow, things are starting to go better. Um, and in that dark part point, I did feel like something was ending, like the world, like just something big. And and uh, my dad called me, and I didn't realize that my mom th- was going in to like check kind of something. She it looked like she had jaundice, basically. Um, I just thought, oh, you know, they're gonna do the the scope down your throat and like whatever. And he called me, and he said they found something, and. And he he doesn't cry often, but he was uh, he was upset, uh, and he said, "I'm I'm scared, you know." And uh, I I just I just said, "It's gonna be all right, you know. It, it'll be okay." And uh, yeah, it turned out that she had pancreatic cancer, and the whole time I kept trying to tell her like we have to stay positive. We've got to like be in prayer. We've got to just, she would say like the statistics. I'm like, I don't want to hear it. You know, just (laughs) God's bigger than that. And, um, I was just, I started just dedicating every day to meditation and really focusing on her healing. And I think it was foolish to think that I think like I thought I could do something like by me within your own power. within my own power somehow just meditating on that and just she will be like you know um, I had like a, a mantra I was basically saying for her healing and um, and, and you know it, it seemed it was a lot of ups and downs like oh it seems like it's getting better or like oh maybe not so so much and then it just went really quick she it was hospice and then before before we knew it she was gone and that whole time i just was convinced that a miracle was going to happen i thought god's going to do a miracle and through this uh, uh, you know people are going to see that glory and um and i'll never forget what my mom said to me before she left it's like um it was so profound and and she's not like that she doesn't say things that are like profound very often but she's a very deep and and spiritual woman Mm -hmm. um but i said mom do do you feel like and this was really close to the end i said do you feel like god wants to heal you or do you think he wants to bring you home and she said it's the same thing wow and 
I was just like, at first I was just like, wait, what? The same thing. Okay, wait. And then I just went in the bathroom and I was praying and, and I was just like, wow, like if she's here, she's healed. If she's not here, she's healed. Yeah. And, you know, selfishly, I wanted her there. And to the very end, to the bitter end, like I thought that was going to, something was going to happen and it didn't. Um, and I still struggle today thinking, you know, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord and what that means and stuff. And it's just hard. Like sometimes I ask God, it's like, where is she? Like, I want to know where she is. Like, give me a dream. I want to see it, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. And she, she was such a, a light to so many people. She and was. I remember telling my family, I'm like, Hey, her light's not here right now. We have to get brighter. And, um, she's just, uh, uh, no one could replace her ever, no. like ever. And, uh, anyone that, that knows her knows that. And, um, she taught me just the love of Christ. She taught me, uh, she, she was a prayer warrior. She, she loved, she was generous and she had a gift that I don't have, which is just like telling everyone about Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> no mean, one was a stranger. To no her. one was a stranger to her. I'm, I'm the complete opposite. I I've been praying for that lately, just more faith in that or, or something. I don't know. But, um, yeah, that was, it's still every, every day. There's not a day that goes by that I don't just think on her, you yeah. know? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's a tough one. Well, Josh, thank you for sharing your journey. I mean, and you, you're a man who's endured a lot, and uh, your family is an incredible support system for you. Your wife is an amazing woman, and uh, your music is incredible, as we talked about earlier. What would what advice would you give to anybody who might be struggling with issues of anxiety or issues of, of depression and things yeah. like that? Um, I think it, it's that it's okay to get help. You know, I think it's okay to to let people know that you are struggling. I think, especially now, you know, it's like we all have to kind of put on this front that everything's okay. Like, how you doing? I'm doing good. You know, how's your walk? Oh, it's great. You know, like, blah, blah, blah. I think the first step is just humbling yourself enough to ad admit that, that there, there's something going on. Um, you know, I don't know how anyone makes it without a belief system in God. Um, I don't, I know I wouldn't be here if I didn't have that. Um, I think that medications can definitely help. I think there's no shame in that, um, you know. And I, I, I think, I think just being being more more open. I think if we all had more conversations about deeper things, it, it would it would really change the world. I think that um, most conversations are pretty like you know surfacey and stuff. And if we could really you know, if your neighbor seems off, like ask him, like really try to see what's going on. Like, you know, if, and, and prayer, I mean, prayer, I think is, is, is so underestimated. I think prayer is so important. Um, crying out to the Lord, crying out. I think sometimes when you're at your bottom, that's when he scoops you up. Just when you think he's not going to, just when you think he's abandoned you, just when you think it's all over. Um, I mean, that's, that's, that's the truth. And yeah. And, I don't know, try to do all the things Barrett was saying too, like lifestyle stuff. Sure. Um, and, and don't smoke weed. You know, <laughs> don't smoke not, weed. It's not, it's not just weed. <laughs> well, Josh, thank you again for sharing your story. Folks, you know, uh, we live in a, uh, we live in a fallen state, you know, um, that's why God sent Christ into this world. We're not, we're, we are subject to, to all of these things. This is part of the fallen state when we go back to original sin in the garden. And, you know, you couldn't have gone through this without a faith intact. I mean, it would have mm -hmm. just been a whole different experience. But there's, there's help out there for you. But first of all, if you're not right with God, get right with God. Make a commitment to Christ. It's just, it's a matter of confessing, I'm a sinner, God. Con forgive me of my sins. Come into my life. Jesus said, said, behold, I stand at the door and I knock. He who hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and sup with him and he with me. And God is good at his promise. Get your faith intact and, and have a walk and a life with Christ. He said, I came to give you life and I came to give you life more abundant. 
And that's what his promise is. Josh is a living example of somebody who's walked through that valley. We walk through valleys and in, in, in peaks in our life. Um, and, and he's been a victor. He's come out the other side. And there's hope. There's hope. And so make that commitment. And find some support. If you're going through this or you have a family member who's going through some kind of uh, these kind of emotional, mental uh, anxiety issues, there's help out there. And we don't, we're not in a place to, 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 to give you those kind of rec- recommendations or references. But, but look, it's there. It's there. But reach out to us, and, and, and perhaps we can. You can reach out to us at prayer at theupperroompresents.com. If you've prayed that prayer of faith, let us know about it. We'd like to send you a Bible, help you get started in your faith. And uh, these are real issues in life. And so, Josh, thank you for sharing them once again. Yeah, thanks, Jim. You bet. Folks, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time on Real Talk. God bless. Thank you.